the archives and history. Um, so uh, speaking of Native American topics, that's of course my subject today. And uh, it's it's been a long running theme of my research for many years. But this this topic, the canal down in, in Gulf Shores is something that we, uh, uh, I never expected to see anything quite like this. It was really quite a, an unusual thing. Uh, I, the, the title I gave discovering uh, the, the canal isn't really accurate. I mean, most discoveries, somebody knows about something beforehand and it just, whoever comes along and publishes on it, it's the one that just says they discovered it. But I, actually in this case, I didn't even do that. So I'll, I'll tell you the whole background story as we, as we progress. Um, this, uh, this topic of, of uh, dugout canoes and their canals uh, is, an, uh, again, a kind of an unusual topic. There, there are lots of, probably hundreds of dugout canoes that have been found throughout the eastern U.S. Uh, over the last couple hundred years. They tend to turn up in all kinds of ways. Uh, we think that some canoes were intentionally submerged to preserve them. Uh, and because uh, they're usually made of things like cypress and longleaf pine, which preserve quite well anyway, and especially if you get them down out of out of the atmosphere, out of the, out of the air, pile pile something in them to submerge them in a lake seems to have been a, a common kind of thing. And then at some point, some of those are forgotten and they turn up centuries later. Uh, other ones around our area, especially on the rivers around the, the southeast, uh, tended to apparently been covered. Uh, by uh, during big storms, uh, when a bank, let's say, let's say a canoe is tied up along a river bank and the, the bank collapses and buries the canoe and then another storm comes by a few centuries later and uncovers the canoe. And that was the case of one uh, in our area, in the Mobile area, um, that it's uh, the one that's on display now in the History Museum of Mobile. It's really a spectacularly nice uh, ancient canoe. Uh, and it was found by two kids who were out um, fishing uh, after one of the big hurricanes. And I've, I, Reed Stowe, my predecessor, told me about this. I think it's about 30 years ago, uh, one of the big hurricanes came through and un uncovered this canoe. And these kids found it and they dug out the muck that was in the bottom and they paddled around for a while. This is a 700 year old canoe. And uh, and then they went home and told their folks about it. And then then the word got out, you know, there's some, this is a pretty major discovery, a very, very nice old ancient canoe. So, so they do t tend to turn up. What we haven't seen much of over the centuries of archaeology that have gone on in this area are canals, actually things uh, intentionally dug for canoe, canoe travel. Uh, and so these are rare uh, kinds of features on the landscape. Uh, this one in Gulf Shores is the only one that's been found and, and actually documented outside of Florida. All of the other six of them are found in, in Florida. So it's kind of a Gulf Coastal thing, apparently. This, this, they're all limited to this region. Uh, we, we do have uh, uh, other evidence of, of canoes from historic times, of course. Lots of people were fascinated by these, and a lot of the colonists, when they arrived here, uh, quickly adopted dugout canoes as, the, as a way to get around throughout the southern river systems and along the coastline uh, because they, they are, they're simple to make. They, they can be done, especially if you have a steel axe, they're much quicker to make than, uh, than uh, most kinds of, of boats. They do tend to last a really long time. So, so we have actually one at the, at the University of South Alabama that uh, is historic and has steel axe marks in it. So they were being made right up until sometime around 1900 is probably about when they stopped being produced. Uh, the ones that are uh, around that we are able to date using radiocarbon dating primarily uh, are mostly Mississippian. That is, they date from around 1,000 to uh, 600 or 500 years ago, somewhere in that range. Uh, and they are t typically this style. They have these kind of prows uh, where people could stand to pole them or, or to paddle. Uh, and I think most of these probably were used, well, the people are standing up in them to actually uh, maneuver these these canoes. And they often have these holes at the ends where they could tie them up to the various uh, places you might be wanting this to stop. Um, this particular one uh, in Gulf Shores uh, ran from, it's on the blue line there, ran from Oyster Bay, uh, which is part of the Mobile Bay system, uh, down to Little Lagoon, which is one of these interesting coastal lakes that uh, intermittently opens to the Gulf, depending on storm uh, activity. And uh, so that apparently was the immediate uh, route to get from Oyster Bay and little, to Little Lagoon and vice versa. Um, and so, uh, and then the star up above there, labeled Plash Island, is the major 
uh, settlement site from the same period, the contemporary settlement that goes with the canal. So we think the people of Plash Island were largely the ones that built the canal. So that's kind of where we started from. Uh, the um, um, canal has, has been uh, known to the locals forever, apparently. Uh, and this uh, fellow, Harry King, is the uh, guy who lives in Gulf Shores that convinced me after years of pestering me to come take a look at this thing. Um, I, I was always really skeptical of it, and I think most archaeologists were, uh, because it doesn't, I mean, there are just so few of them, and, and none of them in Alabama, so it just seemed unlikely on its face that this was actually an authentic ancient canal. And there, there are features from the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries around the, the southeast that kind of look the same to a large extent. Uh, a lot of logging involved, digging ditches and canals and, and uh, flumes and all kinds of things were, were dug that kind of looked sort of like this, uh, running from one waterway to another to move logs around during the big logging uh, days of the late 19th century. And there are other kinds of things. You know, we, in, uh, in South Carolina, for example, you have a lot of canals and, and ditches, big ditches dug for uh, rice cultivation uh, during the colonial period. So there are other things that kind of look like canals that, uh, and, and it takes some, some close study to really just kind of figure out what's, what's what. So, so anyway, when, I, when Harry finally convinced me to come take a look, I was pretty much blown away by this thing because it is so big. Um, difficult to photograph, as Harry demonstrated with this, this photo. Uh, he tried to come up with some way to uh, kind of indicate the topography out there. Um, the, this canal, it, and in fact, most of the places where we find uh, archaeological sites are pretty overgrown in, the, in South Alabama. Uh, lots of palmettos, and they tend to just obscure the ground surface. So if, if for example, if you ever visit the, the big mound site at Bottle Creek out in the middle of the Mobile Tensa Delta, uh, it's, a, it's a heavily forested island uh, with ancient palmettos, you know, six feet high. And uh, if you walk around, you, you will probably will not see most of the mounds. I mean, it's just so dense, vegetation is so dense around there. So, so anyway, it's a challenge. And uh, what, what he was able to do, though, was to um, actually bring me out there and take, let me take a look. And it, it certainly was impressive. Um, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning here, none of these things were ever actually discovered in recent times. They've all always been known. And in fact, this one, uh, family Joy Calloway sent me this photo of her family about uh, 30 years ago, putting up a sign saying Indian Ditch, and that's how the, the locals referred to this uh, this big feature. Uh, it's an unfortunate term, uh, the ditch part in particular, because it's, that implies you're just kind of tunneling along uh, from one body of water to another, connecting two bodies of water. Uh, that's not at all what this is about. This was actually a canal that functioned in a very different way uh, at uh, above sea level, the, the, at the at the highest point of the peninsula, that this canal crossed, you're about six meters above sea level. So they're well above any way that water could flow from one body of water to the other. It's just not how it worked at all. So I'll explain what we learned about it as we as we went along. Um, what we first tried to do when we uh, got started, and this is all, when I say we, there's a whole bunch of volunteers that have worked together on this project. Uh, since I retired, I no longer had students to, and, and, uh, you know, dragoon into projects, and, uh, and I still had to, we, we've always actually had a volunteer corps that has worked with us on, and so they, they were there already, and I have uh, tried to include them in these presentations as well. And, um, and, and several of them worked really uh, very effectively as, as researchers uh, looking for earlier publications of this particular canal. So the Spring Hill College uh, publication from 1899 highlighted a visit to the canal. You can see in the upper right here, again, how difficult it is to photograph. There's called people standing in the canal, and you really can't make anything out there. But uh, the, the view on the, the bottom, the purplish view, uh, is very much like it looks today. This is the en entrance to the canal on Little Lagoon, the south end. Um, what we learned in our research was that in the 1820s and 30s, uh, this is the big canal building boom of the of the U.S. history. Uh, Erie Canal kind of starts off the canal building and then it, it just goes crazy throughout the eastern part of the country for, for several decades until railroads kind of took over. But, uh, but of course, this area along the waterways of South Alabama seemed ideal to try to uh, build new canals 
And so the Army Corps of Engineers sent several people down to uh, take a look and figure out where these might go. Uh, this particular one from 1834 shows a projected canal to just exactly where the uh, intracoastal waterway was built in the 1930s. So this was anticipated a century earlier by this French engineer that came here to look around. And uh, uh, fortunately, he didn't. He, this guy didn't know about the ancient canal, or he might have put his canal there. You know, there's. It, it's amazing that this has survived because of the um, the logical nature of placing canals in these spots it occurs to a lot of different people uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, the, the most interesting uh, turned up from the 1820s, though, it was published in 1833. But there's uh, one uh, uh, engineer in the uh, army it was. I guess it was actually. I think he was actually working for the uh, 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 quartermaster general of the U.S. Army at the time. So it's kind of sort of like the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and there's a guy named uh, Captain Birch. And he uh, came down and he looked uh, around it for canals, also roadways. He was interested in building new military roads. But uh, he added this little report here, which I'll just mention a few little extracts from it. He says that uh, he, he drew a map, which I'll show you in, in a second, uh, that shows an, an old vestiges of an ancient canal is what he wrote on it. And when he went to talk to the locals, they said, uh, you know, we've always known about this. We have no idea who built it. It's way before anybody that we know lived in the area. So what, they're, what, they, told, what they told him and how he interpreted it was it's preceded white settlement. He doesn't actually attribute it to the Indians, which is kind of typical of the time because this is kind of a you know, racialized subject already and by the 1820s and 30s. And so they weren't, I don't think, willing to give credit to uh, Indians for anything, uh, mound building or anything like that. But, but, but he did say somebody before uh, modern uh, settlement. And so he got at least in the ballpark in terms of, of age. This is a little extract of his map. If you're familiar with uh, the Fort Morgan Peninsula, Gulf Shores would be kind of over to the right side of the map. Uh, Fort Morgan would be here on Mobile Point on the left. And so um, it's about midway down the peninsula. One interesting aspect of this map, it shows uh, shells up on the top. Uh, everything's cockeyed. He, he wrote from 12 different directions on this map here, but uh, it says shells. That's called shell banks today. And it is, it's kind of largely gone now, but it was one of the biggest uh, prehistoric sites in the area, uh, a little post-dating the canal, actually. Uh, okay, so once we had established that this has been known really from the beginning of, of, um, of colonial settlement in the region, we tried to find other evidence of its existence before modern development kind of obscured a lot of the course of the canal. And so we found these two maps. And I know this is very difficult to see there. Uh, the one on the left is slightly clearer. You might be able to make out a trace running from one end of the, from the south to the north there. It's just a faint line. Uh, but it is continuous. It actually does run all the way from Oyster Bay to Little Lagoon. So we're pretty certain that the entire length was just under a mile. It's really quite a large project. Uh, when we calculated the amount of earth moved to build this canal, it's about equivalent to some of the biggest earthen mounds ever constructed in, in ancient times. So it's a, it's a, ma it's a major engineering project that, that was involved in building this canal. Um, when I think about how I might have gone about it back, you know, 1400 years ago, um, the digging of the sand is the easy part. This is actually very sandy soil here. It's not that hard to dig at all. The, the challenge, I think, would have been clearing an, an, an early forest for a mile. Uh, and, you know, you have deep rooted trees and just a, innumerable obstacles in the ground. Uh, to deal with. I think it would have taken quite a long time to burn all that out, uh, probably years of planning and preparation before they could actually dig the canal. And then he would have had to dig it in a, largely in a dry season because the canal does, at both ends, goes into marshy territory. And so you couldn't, I mean, if you try to dig sand underwater, you know, like the beach, it just fills right in. You can't do it. So uh, with, with simple tools. So um, it had to have been done in certain ways over a fairly long period of time. Uh, by 1974, the area is already being developed and we're already beginning to see loss of some portions of the canal. And uh, part of this is, is due to development. Part of it is just due to storm surge. Uh, as I'll show you toward the end of the talk here, the, the, the canal uh, remnants have tended to fill in during big storm surges that bring huge amounts of sand with them into the interior of the peninsula. 
And uh, so we're losing the lowest lying parts uh, entirely. You can't really see them at all anymore on the ground. They're still there, but they're buried now. All right, so we, we did have uh, access to a couple really talented people that, uh, as, as I said, this is largely a volunteer project, but we did have some people we had to pay because they're working for a living. They needed to, to have some income. And so the city of Gulf Shores actually was uh, very kindly provided uh, funding for a couple key individuals to uh, help us with this project. Uh, and then one colleague uh, that, that didn't require pay is, uh, is uh, Alex Beebe. I'm going to highlight him in particular because he's a hydrologist. And uh, so he studies groundwater fluctuations in the, in the area. And that was exactly what we needed. But beyond his expertise, amazingly, he had actually been monitoring a, a, a well about six feet from the canal. And he had no idea the canal was there. This has been going on for years. Uh, he'd come down every few months and check the water, water level fluctuations there. So he had all this uh, really remarkably good data to show us how the canal's presence and its depth related to modern day uh, groundwater fluctuations. And that's what you needed to figure out how this canal worked. So I'll get into that in a moment here. So that work was down here in the south end. These are the two areas that you can see today. If you go down and visit, you can go to the area on Little Lagoon uh, at the south there. And that little portion has now been preserved by the Archaeological Conservancy. Uh, it was owned by the Meyer Foundation, it's a big real estate uh, foundation, and they donated it to the Conservancy. That's, that's the only part now that's preserved, is this little segment to the south. There is a section in the, in the middle that's privately owned, and then there's all the rest of it that's buried and no longer visible. So here's the, here's the southern section uh, from today. It looks just the same as it did in 1899 when the Spring Hill folks came out. Uh, so one of the folks we did need to, to pay is Howard Sear. He's a geoarchaeologist. He studies soils. I'm, I'm pretty reluctant to, to go out and dig a site anymore without a geoarchaeologist around because they're so much better at reading soils than, than I am. And uh, I think most archaeologists are kind of realizing that we didn't really understand what we were digging through all these uh, many years now. But uh, he's, he's a whiz at this. And so what he uh, recommended doing was taking core samples at a couple key points across the canal to kind of understand, uh, since it is largely uh, buried now, uh, to be able to see what its original depth was, how it filled in, kind of the history of the uh, the construction and then abandonment of the of the canal. So he had lots of fun mucking around out in the swamps there, the two two locations that we cored, and uh, I won't try to go into any detail here. But this is what he ends up with: these little narrow cores where he looks very carefully at the different kinds of sediment. The the color is pretty, is kind of the most evident from these slides. And the dark is, is clearly organic material. It's filled in the canal. The white at the bottom, that's the base subsoil. And uh, this is the south end of the canal, which was the deepest part. So it actually is about five feet deep at this point. Um, and up at the top, you see bands of white. And that is, uh, that's, that's classic storm deposits. When we, when we dig a site in anywhere in the, on the coastline in the Mobile area and we find pure white sand, that's the, that's the signature of a hurricane, basically. That's what it brings in this clean sand from out in the Gulf and dumps it on land and you have this big bands of white. And we think that's what put an end to the use of the canal, in fact, is that when that, whatever storm that was, uh, that, that basically filled it in and it was it would have meant they would have had to redig the entire canal, and they apparently didn't decide to do that. So, so anyway, these are very instructive kinds of little bits of information we accumulated. Um, I'm an old-fashioned archaeologist, so I really like to dig something myself to actually see what's what's going on. So, rather than dealing with the cores, I, that was my part of the task was to get the volunteers together and dig a couple trenches across the uh, canal at two points, and so. Uh, and there's some amazing people that showed up in the process. This is uh, uh, Aubrey Fulford down here on the left. He, he's, it's uh, his family that owned a good portion of the middle part of the canal uh, way back in the early 1900s. And uh, he's a World War II vet. He died just earlier this year at 97. But he came out and, and supervised quite a bit. And, uh, and then Cam West was a similar, uh, similar age. Uh, she was so uh, incredibly active. She died a couple of years ago, by, about the same age, about 96. But she was out there digging with us. You know, I don't think I'm going to be digging at 96. I'm pretty sure I won't be. Um, so anyway, it was, it was a really great uh, experience to meet a lot of these local people. 
Um, and I, as usual, I, whenever my sons are around, I enlist them in these projects. So they were out there digging with me in these, on these shots here. But we basically just dug two trenches and then looked at the layers of soil uh, more, in a more continuous way than we could do with the cores. And here's a, some of the volunteers. There's actually quite a few more that didn't make it into the, the photo here. Um, all right, so here's what we ended up with on the long uh, cross section. Uh, we unfortunately had a kind of a big black smudge in the middle. That's where a tree fairly recently rotted and kind of disturbed the middle. But otherwise, it's largely intact across the entire width of the canal. It's about uh, over, it's over 20 feet on the interior part of the canal, 30 feet from the outer berms. So it's a big, it's a big thing, and it would have taken a lot of effort to, to, to be, uh, build this, this canal. Just an effort to create a composite across it. This part and the lower part, though, this is really what was key to understanding the, the sequence of events. We had this kind of light, lighter brownish soil at the bottom. That's undisturbed ancient uh, soil. The ancient here actually isn't that old. Uh, the peninsula itself is only about 4,500 years old. Uh, and if you think about the... Um, the end of the ice age, and it was quite a long time ago, 10 or 12,000 years ago, but it's taken most of that time from then till now for, for the sea levels to gradually rise as the, uh, it's partly rebound, it's all kinds of things going on, but, but so, uh, I'm sorry, uh, water levels, ocean levels have been gradually rising, and it kind of stabilized around 4,000 years ago, and that's about when Dauphin Island forms in its modern configuration and, and these big peninsulas form. So they're not that old, but they're much older, of course, than, um, uh, than the canal. So that's, that's ancient soil down there. So they come in and they dig the canal. They, they basically use baskets and, and some kind of hoe type implements to dig the sand out and they carry it to the two sides and they build up the berms. They build these kind of, um, sort of like, like levees on either side of the, of the canal. And so that's what's going on on the left. There are these uh, two, two layers above the pre-canal. That's the berm that's being formed during construction. So the topsoil comes out first, and it's more organic, so it looks darker. And then the deeper soils go up, go up last, and so they look lighter. So it looks like reversing the layers of soils in the ground as you build the canal. And then the big storm comes in, the big hurricane, around 700 AD or something like that. And it, that's what all that white sand is. Uh, we think the canal's already abandoned by that time, though. So there's a little layer of slump uh, below that. So it's so anyway, this kind of gives us an idea of the sequence of events uh, that went on here. Um, okay, this is at the south end, we uh, tried to do the same thing, tried to cross the entire canal with a trench, ran into a major sewer pipeline that was running from, from uh, Gulf Shores across to the, to the uh, big condos on the beach across Little Lagoon. So that had kind of screwed up the, about half of that part of the canal. We did get to see part of it there. Uh, this gives you an idea of, of what's going on in terms of uh, modern utilities. We tried to use ground penetrating radar. We tried to use all kinds of techniques that are really cutting edge these days of how you learn what's below the ground without digging. You know, the idea is to get as much uh, information as possible without actually having to do all that work. And so uh, we brought out uh, folks from Old Miss to do the ground penetrating radar. And mainly what they found was uh, utility lines. And let's see, here's a, that's the big uh, sewer line that ran right across the Little Lagoon, actually, underneath Little Lagoon. Here's our canal. It doesn't show up as anything different than anything else. It is just the, the modern disturbances swamp any kind of old signals from the from the canal itself so we have we have power lines gas lines all kinds of things going on here tried to pick it up here this is the same problem all kinds of modern disturbances another power line so it just was kind of hopeless that didn't help us at all um so the question then was you know who who built it and when that's what we really needed to resolve and so what we did was take uh, a bit bits of charcoal from different parts of the of that uh, canal cross section that I showed you earlier and got good dates on quite a few of them. And they all basically coincide right around 8,600. They're, they're, they cluster very well. So we're quite confident that that's about when it was built. We don't yet know when it was uh, abandoned. And that has been a real challenge. Uh, actually, actually, both parts of this have been a challenge for everybody studying ancient canals. How do you put a date on 
what's essentially just sand. Um, and so people have tried to mainly focus on the organics that, that fill in the canal. You know, when you have a, any kind of a, a ditch, you're going to get scum and all kinds of stuff, you know, organics growing down in the ditch. And so, you, so people have said, well, we'll date that. It turns out, though, that modern day plants tend to like those same kind of locations. And so their roots are always going down in that same low spot. And so you get a really complicated, long, centuries long accumulation of, of organics. And it, it doesn't seem to actually work to date a canal that way. So what I managed to do in this case was take a look at the berm. And, you know, I mentioned that it, I thought about probably the most work of building a canal would be actually clearing the forest. Well, that would be the first step. You basically have to burn all that off of whatever vegetation is on the, on, the, on, on the landscape at that time, you burn it all. You create a layer of charcoal, essentially, and then when you build a canal, you cover it up with the soil that's coming out of the canal, forming the berms. So you go to the base of the berm, you'll find a little bit of charcoal, and that's what we did. We, in fact, that kind of confirmed our suspicion that that was the sequence, but it also gave us one of these really tight dates uh, for the construction of the canal. And so people who have worked on canals in Florida are going back and checking their canals because they didn't they didn't think of this, and so they need to go get some dates because all their dates are way later than mine, and I think we're probably all talking about kind of the same general period around 8600 to 700 for construction of most of the canals in the southeast. Um, so something else came up in the process of studying the canal. We found that there were several little sites nearby, uh, and actually two of them are very interesting down near Little Lagoon at the south end. Two little, they look like mounds. Turned out they're not earth, they're not burial mounds at all. They're little sand dunes that formed naturally on either side of the canal. And people who were using the canal apparently used those little high points as places to process fish and shellfish. So they're they're taking their canoes apparently down to Little Lagoon, going out, getting gathering up clams and fishing, and then taking sitting on top of these little little um, sand dunes and, and starting fires to open the shellfish because that's before before oyster knives that's the only way to op open an oyster or clam is you have to heat it and it'll it'll gape a little bit you can get into there into the shell uh, and they're also drying fish for use later so they're kind of really intensively processing uh, seafood right there on on either side of the canal we also think that's probably a location where there might have been dams built across the two ends, the far north and far, far southern end of the canal. Uh, because if you don't do that, and you're, you're depending on uh, groundwater to fill the canal, it's all going to just run off those two ends, you know, unless you create a dam. So you kind of have to have a dam on either end there. And that seems to be the most likely spot for that. So we dug across these little, uh, little sand dune kind of middens, and you see there's just heaps of of debris, mostly shells visible here. So, you know, archaeologists love dirt, so I just love to look at these things. These are just like classic examples of, of stratigraphy. You could actually dissect this apart and look at different fishing events out here if you wanted, if you wanted to do that. Uh, if you look real closely at the at these kind of middens, there, besides all the shell, which is really obviously visible, there's millions and millions of fish bones. They're much less visible, but they're by far, more of more the food came from fish than from shellfish. So what we have to do in this kind of situation is uh, get bucket loads of this kind of midden and take it back to the laboratory and sort it all out. And so it takes a lot of effort, really. We haven't, be, again, being a volunteer project, we haven't spent the time we, we, that we will someday uh, analyzing all the fish bones. But I did look at all the all the shellfish. Uh, big clams. I didn't. I wasn't even actually aware that... Clams were a big thing down here on the Gulf. I always kind of associate with that with New England, but uh, there's a, this southern quahog. Is, uh, it, there's a big population of them in Little Lagoon that's quite famous among biologists, apparently. Uh, and then scallops by the millions. They loved scallops at that site. Uh, angel wing, which um, I've, I've heard is, is really tasty, but I've never actually met anybody who ate one, so <laughs> I've read about them. Uh, and I've not tried them, but they, they, they're supposed to be quite good. Uh, and then uh, little um, uh, coquinas uh, by the millions, pretty making soup out of coquinas, uh, just like you can do today. If you if you would go to the beach, that's where they're going to be found by the millions. Uh, and then a few other things, uh, a few mammal uh, remains, uh, mostly deer bone, but it's mostly a fishing fishing spot apparently. And then lots of pottery, of course, which would be used for doing the cooking for some of these uh, foods. 
All right, so then how did it, how did it work? Uh, what the hydrologist, Alex Beebe, was uh, working on was his modern data. And um, that gave us a pretty good idea of probably how the canal worked. There are certain times of the year, uh, mostly the cooler times of year when there's not so much evaporation of, of uh, water from the water table. Water table tends to be higher in winter around our area. And so he's, he detected a period of about three months where he probably could have used the canal pretty easily, uh, especially if there were dams on either end. Um, so, uh, so that's what we think. But what he pointed out was that between AD 600 and today, there have been a lot of changes in the nature of the groundwaters in this area. One of them has to do with the continually rising sea levels uh, that's why we have a marshy part of the canal on Oyster Bay, because they used to be dry land, now it's in marsh. So we've had rising sea levels. Also along the Gulf Coast, uh, from New Orleans to the here, uh, to, to the Mobile area, uh, there's been pretty steady subsidence of the soils, of the ground, of the ground surface uh, through time. Uh, and that's because of the massive amount of silt that comes down the Mississippi River every year. And as it is as that silt is deposited out in the Gulf, it actually weights down the surface of the Gulf and depresses the entire region. So we have declining uh, surface of the, of the ground and rising sea levels both. So we basically have quite a different water environment today than we did back 600 uh, AD. But he thought that, you know, we went through all these different, there's many other complications to it. And basically what he decided was that they all kind of tend to cancel each other out. And we're probably looking at roughly the same kind of time period, about three months in the winter when the canal was useful back then, just as it would be today if we tried to dig this canal again. So here are the other uh, half dozen. There's one up kind of east of Pensacola that was found many years ago. And I think it's long gone now. I haven't gone to look, but it's very heavily uh, developed uh, with housing today. But the other ones are in pretty good shape if you go down to Pine Island, for example, near uh, near Sanibel uh, and Fort Myers, you can still see the Pine, Pine Island Canal crossing the island. Uh, the one out in the Lake Okeechobee and the, especially the two down at Cape Sable in the Everglades, they're both in, largely intact and those are miles long. There's much longer than ours, three, four, three or four or five miles long. Um, so they, they were um, a, a pretty major part of the old landscape for, for some time and it probably are probably probably many more that we don't know about yet. Uh, so one, one result of our article seems to be that people are beginning to look uh, around the coastal areas in between all these, these stars and see if we can find some more of them. Uh, the only other major canals that have been studied in North America that are prehistoric, pre-Columbian, are the Hohokam uh, irrigation canals out in Arizona. And those are obviously a completely different kind of thing. You know, the, instead of um, I mean, groundwater doesn't really have anything to do with it. They're actually trying to move water from a source of water to their fields. And so they actually would plaster the inside of canals. And so it's just a totally different kind of, of animal than uh, what we have here, which are navigation canals. All right, so to kind of wrap it up here. Um, although the big site nearby, the one that was on Plash Island today, uh, is the most likely candidate for kind of the focus of activity building the canal and using it. Uh, there are many other sites of that same era around. And so it's probably a very large population that was drawn on to build this thing. As you might expect, if you're gonna be building one of the biggest construction projects ever in the Gulf Coast, uh, you can't probably do it with a single village. It's gonna have to be a larger community. Uh, what's interesting though, is that these are not um, very complex societies in terms of uh, there's no hierarchy, there's no chief that we think of during this, this time period that would have been able to actually coerce people into building it. You would have had to actually try to convince them to help out uh, and in a cooperative sort of ways. And, and so th this is a, a non-hierarchical kind of setting uh, socially. Okay, so as far as the future goes, uh, we have managed to preserve one portion. We'd like to see the rest of the, the visible part of the canal preserved if possible. It always depends on a willing uh, landowner to, you know, willing to sell it. So we're, we're, I know there's negotiations underway and we'll see what happens with that. Uh, we did produce this one technical article. If you're interested in reading more about the nuts and bolts of what we uh, found, if you just Google history and hydrology, you probably will find this article. It's been, it, it's freely available too. We, uh, this, this, again, the city of Gulf Shores paid the, 
the journal a few thousand dollars to make it freely accessible to everybody. So, because they had, they already invested money in it, they wanted their citizens to be able to go look at it. So everybody can see it now. And there it is. Um, one thing we haven't done much with yet is the north end of the canal because it is under this marsh and just tech, just you know, logistically a challenge to work with. Uh, this is a photo taken almost a century ago uh, when it was pretty obviously visible uh, on the surface, but um, today it's not. And so what uh, Alex Beebe not only does hydrology, he also works with this uh, LIDAR data, this laser um, data. You may have been hearing about this. It's, there's lots of archaeologists that are really very enthusiastic about LIDAR data because it can actually uh, kind of you know, digitally, in a digital way, you can remove the vegetation, you can move a forest, take it out, strip the forest away, and you end up with just the ground surface. And so uh, this canal in, in, the, in the, let's see if I can see it from here. Um, oops. Um, yeah, I'll just work with this one. So down here, this is the part of the canal that's visible today where Harry took me originally. And, uh, and so you kind of lose it there, but then you pick it up here again. So there's, there's a very shallow trench kind of running out through here. <laughs> What's that? And uh, it goes on to about there. These odd little potholes or some kind of strange geological phenomenon out there. But we know from the 1934 photo and from other information that the canal did go all the way out to Oyster Bay way up here. So we've lost this part. And what Alex was able to do was to look at storm data, before and after storm data, and he showed that, in fact, it was, it was Hurricane Sally that, that filled in the northern stretch of the canal. So we're gradually, gradually losing it kind of visually. Uh, but, you know, with, with all kinds of technical uh, approaches like, like GPR, like your ground penetrating radar, where you don't have a lot of utilities, what we're trying to do is get somebody with a small boat to drag or maybe just wade out there into the marsh and drag a GPR across and see if we can pick it up and, uh, and, and learn more about the north end of the canal. And then uh, this just turned up a couple of days ago. A friend of mine in North Carolina was asking me about this French document that dates to around 1725. And it's mostly just kind of lists the uh, native towns around Mobile Bay during the early French period. But in the middle of the text, you talk, there's a mention of a canal. There's an uh, English translation down here. And it says, um, there's an arm river which forms a kind of canal which seems to have been formed naturally, but you know, maybe not. Maybe it's another uh, ancient canal that was um, noticed back in the, in the 18th century. So there's other kind of leads we have in our own vicinity that might, be, uh, might give us other examples of this sort of thing. And I mentioned Bottle Creek a while ago, the Mississippian mound site in the middle of the Mobile Tensaw Delta, uh, there's an odd feature there that people have long said was a canal. So, so there's, more, there's more canal work to do if we uh, can find the resources and the, the volunteers to do it. And then one last thought, um, when, when looking at this canal, you, today you can walk down a lot of it, you know, it's all filled in to a large extent, and you can still see the berms on the either side and parts of it. So as you're walking along, uh, it occurred to me that what a couple of things. One is that the native people who built the canal actually built a river. I mean, I don't know if they, I don't know if they thought of it that way, but that's essentially what they did. And I kind of suspect that's that's probably why they did it to actually create their own river. Uh, and so I began to think in terms of other things that have parallel berm like like things. And uh, one is what occurs on these old um, early 18th century Indian maps. There's some, there's, this one's actually on display, not the original, but there's a photo of this one out in the uh, exhibit out here. And um, what they typically did in terms of drawing roadways and paths and maps and, and, and uh, on maps and, and, and rivers on, uh, on these Indian maps was to draw two parallel lines. And they didn't distinguish them on the maps. When, if, if an Indian was describing the area to you and describing the map, they could tell you which was a river and which was a path, but visually they are, they're depicted the same. And so I think in, the, in a way, uh, and there's another example here. This, uh, well, this is just a, my key to that. The blue ones are the rivers, the black ones are the, are the paths, and they're, they're shown identically on this thing. So, so they're thinking of, of them as, at, least, as the, at least as comparable and maybe as almost interchangeable that there's a way to 
to take a river to any location, and sometimes it's on land, sometimes it's on water. Uh, there's some interesting things to think about in terms of what, the, what, the, what these canals might have meant to the people who built and used them. And uh, one last thing is this uh, image of earthworks that are contemporary or just maybe slightly older than our canal that are up in Ohio. This is part of the Newark earthworks, the big Hopewell uh, earthworks that just a couple of days ago became a World Heritage Site. Uh, UNESCO just voted to, that these amazing geometrical earthworks up in Ohio uh, should be recognized as world-class uh, antiquities. And they're very much the same as, uh, as our canal. In, in visually, there's long uh, parallel lines of these things across the landscape. One of them runs through many miles across central Ohio. And uh, so I can imagine those being considered somehow is, 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 is comparable in some way to the canals that are being built further south and by, by very much the same kind of cultural people. Okay, I think that's it. And a bunch of people to thank there. So, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. We do have time for questions. So in the in-person audience, I'll bring you the microphone. If you're our virtual audience, you can submit it in the comments and I can get it on my phone and I'll read it for you. Uh, so I have one right here. Thank you for that, doctor. Uh, how far did, was the navigable part of the canal useful and could two canoes pass <laughs> that wide? Um, and did the Indians use it for more than just food? Right, right. Good, good questions about uh, the various kinds of uses of it. Um, well, to, to take the easy one first, it's it's not. We it wouldn't have been wide enough for two canoes. I mean, you might be able to drag a canoe to the side and get one through, but the, actually, the shape of the of the channel is kind of tapered toward the center. So it probably would have just been the center that was most usable with the with the deepest water. Uh, and so I think it's one one at a time probably throughout there. But uh, I think they needed that width because you in sand you get slumping. So you had to have a certain amount of very low taper to this over a considerable length. So, so they were quite wide, but far wider than they would need for just, uh, just the one canoe. Uh, the other kind of activities that are going on would be, um, actually, I think the uh, use for fishing and shelving fishing is probably the least important reason to build, to go to all this trouble to build a mile long canal. Uh, what this did was open up, um, canoe travel between the entire Alabama River system, which takes you all the way up to Tennessee, uh, and most of the Gulf. And you can actually go from uh, Little Lagoon back, back in that day. You could have gone through little tiny channels uh, all the way to, uh, I think it's Chaka, Chaklahatchee or something. There's some, some bay very far east of Pensacola. You can actually get a long distance by canoe with this, with this single canal. So it would have had a big impact on long distance travel. And the, they, they were doing all kinds of things. We know they're moving shells from the Gulf interior to the interior. They're moving a lot of goods around, all kinds of, of interesting artifacts, probably of, of great interest to them uh, that would have been far more valuable than the food itself. So. Can you tell us how the diggers of the canal were able to maintain level as they dug? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have any direct evidence of that, but there's, uh, there, there's lots of studies of mound building in particular, and those are often built to really tight specifications. And so I imagine they just use water levels. That's how most people did it until fairly modern times, uh, using sight lines across bowls full of water. Um, and, and beyond that, I don't, I don't know. They, they um, you know, the, the, for example, the geometric earthworks that I showed you at the very end, they're the Newark earthworks, extremely precise in terms of diameter of the circles and the measurement of the angles. And they're actually aligning the, the, those entire constructions with astronomical points on the horizon, sort of setting and rising of, of, of Milky Way and all kinds of things are going on with those earthworks. We, we've not really looked into that. We don't have enough detail yet on these canals to know whether the courses of them were, uh, were important in other ways, not maybe not so practical reasons, you know, for why they chose that angle to run from the lagoon to the, 
to Oyster Bay. There's all kinds of questions there that we, we don't know the answer to, but uh, you know, given the fact that this thing does seem to have been actually usable, uh, they, must have, they must have thought a lot about these other, other aspects of it that we don't yet, yet understand. Hi, um, Hi, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, do you have an approximation on how long it may have taken to, to construct the whole mile? And two, is there a way in which the descendants of the community are actually being um, like included or informed about the discoveries that are the, you know, discoveries that are being made contemporarily? You mean the native communities? Yes. The, you know, descendant communities? Um, to some extent, we, we worked with the porch band of Creek Indians in the area, and there's some of those folks are actually our volunteers, longstanding volunteers, so so they're well aware. And uh, we have had visits. Uh, the um, Department of Transportation had a, a tribal consultation while we were working on the little uh, uh, shellfishing earthwork, or the little mound-like structures out there. And so there's been visits, visits, and uh, we haven't, in fact, one of the reasons I want to go back and do more and kind of look more at the meaning behind the canal, not just the practical function, but the more of the social meanings of it is that we, uh, we would lo love to have input from uh, native tribal collaborators on that aspect of it. Um, and the Seminoles may be uh, the most knowledgeable about kind of working with waterways today. So, so that's still something to come, but we hope that that happens. What was your, I'm sorry, your first part of your question? The first part was, do you have like a, an approximation on how long it oh, would have taken right. to, to build the mile? Right, yeah, that's a really tough thing to, to understand. And, and I, I mean, I'm just guessing that, uh, as I mentioned before, that the preparation would have taken probably several years. Uh, you're dealing with lots of really big trees and stumps that have to be removed. Um, but uh, once you start digging, those kind of things can go very quickly. Uh, there was. The best study I know of, the, of this sort occurred at Poverty Point, the big, very ancient mound center in, in Louisiana. And uh, there were some very clever uses of the pollen and other kinds of, of, of plant data that were coming out of layers in, the, in those mounds. And they, were, they concluded that it was less than a year to construct really large earthworks. So that would be my guess that this thing would not be drawn out longer than you needed you know the preparation would take far longer than actually getting everybody together to do the the digging um yeah that'd just be my guess but that that seems to be kind of where archaeology is going these days with that kind of question all right well thank you again to dr walsall okay. thank you and thank you to everyone who's joined us let's give him a big round of applause again <laughs> Those of you who are here in person, we are selling copies of his book, A Conquering Spirit, which was about Fort Mims and the Red Stick War. And he has said that he will be willing to sign a copy for you today. Uh, if you're online, don't fret, you'll be able to buy it online in our online store, uh, Alabama Original. And I hope to see all of you again in October. Thank you.